Relative bodhicitta is focused on uh, dharmas, things. And absolute bodhicitta is concerned with, or you could say focused on dharmata, or the nature of things. Therefore, usually when we say to generate bodhicitta or use the term bodhicitta, we are referring to relative bodhicitta. Absolute bodhicitta really refers to the wisdom which realizes emptiness. We call it bodhicitta, but it is not something that one generates in the manner of generating relative bodhicitta. Yamshadis <coughs> As was the case with relative bodhicitta, the cultivation of absolute bodhicitta here is divided into two aspects, the practice of meditation and the post-meditation uh, application. The practice of meditation here is the cultivation of a state free from fixation. The post-meditation practice is to come to recognize the unreality of uh, potential objects of attachment and aversion. Mm. <laughs> The, f the first of these, the practice of meditation on Absolute Bodhicitta, is described in stanza 22, which is found on the bottom of page 27 and the top of page 28, which says, Whatever appears, all of this is one's own mind, and the mind itself has always been beyond any kind of conceptual extreme. Knowing that, it is the practice of a bodhisattva to abstain from mental engagement in um, reifying the attributes of, per of perceived subject and object. Then Dig Nilu
External and internal phenomena, the things that we experience or that appear to us, appear real to us, as though they exist as we experience them, independently of our experience of them. But that independent reality that we attribute to appearances is a mere superimposition of our minds because appearances do not exist outside or beyond uh, the experience of them. Secondly, that mind to which the things appear has always, from the very beginning, been beyond or without any kind of complexity, which means any kind of state of being uh, existent or non-existent. Therefore, Knowing that this is the nature, both of apparent objects and of the subjective perceiver or mind, bodhisattvas do not entertain in their minds reification of the perceived attributes of objects and subjects, but rest in a state of emptiness beyond elaboration, beyond complexity. And this is how bodhisattvas practice in meditation, or cultivate in meditation, absolute bodhicitta, otherwise put, the wisdom of emptiness. And then, as in Gyasa Thome Sambu, the Shungi, Zababu, Gyasa Thome Sambu, Kurangi Zeshabe, the Sung Shindag Nalo in the Yang, the Jume Gingana, Yimi Nyaksha Chas, the Jesuari. Chetamche Tobe In another of his writings, Gyatse Tome Zongpo, who wrote the 37 practices of the Bodhisattva, wrote, rest non-dually in the state beyond elaboration, which is instruction that comes to the same, has the same meaning as found in this stanza, which is that based on the fact that all things, all dharmas, both uh, perceived objects and the perceiving subject or mind, are empty, which means that they are beyond elaboration, beyond any kind of ontological concept. Knowing that, one does not engage in or entertain a concepts about them, such as true existence or non-existence. And that is how uh, one cultivates absolute bodhicitta in even placement or meditation. That legalia. ダベナ、ガジュナノレア。てね、ジズミジバナマ、ダカンドラジ、チャケシンボ。ダマ、カンドラジ、ガジュナノラジ、チャケシンビニャメ。で、ジズミジバナマ、ギュデビ、チャケ
Sunday Within the Kaju tradition, one of the foremost practices is the practice of Mahamudra, which has come down from uh, Lord Maitripa. And the particular teachings of Maitripa are often called the Amaniskara cycle, or the cycle of freedom from mental engagement. Amaniskara is explained in two ways. Sometimes it's explained as mental engagement in emptiness, more commonly translated literally explained as the absence of freedom from mental engagement. In either case, this refers to the uh, authentic way to practice even placement on the absolute bodhicitta. The same point is made by Tenga Jampa Zompo in the lineage supplication, uh, which we uh, recited earlier and commonly chant. In the uh, stanza which says, it is said that absence of distraction is the main body of meditation. To the meditator who rests in uh, whatever, fre- in, who rests freshly in whatever thought arises without contrivance or alteration, grant your blessing that meditation be free from conceptualization. What is being described here is resting without alteration in the sense of without the imposition or superimposition of concepts such as it is this or it isn't this and so on and remaining one-pointed in a state free from mental engagement in such uh, concepts and relaxing in that state and that seems to be the way to authentically cultivate absolute bodhicitta. Mm Yam the next stanza deals with post meditation and specifically the post meditation of uh, absolute bodhicitta, which is the relinquishment of uh, imputation of reality to potential objects of attachment and aversion. Although our meditation or even placement may not be fully authentic, it may merely be concordant, 
Still, at the end of a session of practice, we eventually have to arise, leave the meditation room or shrine room, and enter the state of post-meditation, or sometimes called subsequent attainment. This is the state in which we become involved in various activities. The next stanza, stanza 23 on page 28, deals with the first aspect of this, how in post-meditation to relinquish or abandon fixation on the reality of potential objects of attachment. The stanza says, the pleasurable objects uh, that we encounter or desirable objects that we encounter are just like the appearance of a rainbow uh, in the summer. Although they are beautiful in appearance, uh, they are unreal. And it is therefore the practice of a bodhisattva not to regard them as real and thereby to relinquish craving and fixation on them. Tadi,一动于，让给，一动我身上长到，让了一了贴吧，真正给他与，让给，超过一年长到，养了就数贴吧的，长年吧的，啊，吃什么了，说吧，真正给，啊，大家这边有人，一年长到，看到。看这几遍，特别那样，有看这几遍特别那样，差不多就有看这几遍。你当他们这边，也就跟江浙那些，也就跟江浙那些一样，他打散了，嗯，这都点不起来的，那样，成都就开始说，就开始说宁波面不是那
The next stanza, stanza 24, also on page 28, is, uh, corresponds with that and describes how to uh, relinquish or abandon fixation on uh, unpleasant appearances that might produce aversion. It says, the different kinds of suffering that we experience are like a dreaming of one of your children dying. Taking confused appearances as real is unnecessarily exhausting. Therefore, when met with adverse conditions, it is the practice of a bodhisattva to see them as delusion. <laughs> Milam Dembrasuan Shukshambhamijayabhaji. <laughs> When we encounter something that we regard as unpleasant, such as a person we think of as our enemy, or an unpleasant sound, or a feeling of misery, or see the suffering of others, and so on, it is appropriate to regard these unpleasant objects of experience as no more real than, for example, dreaming that someone you love uh, dies and the experience of sadness you feel during that dream. We exhaust ourselves by fixating on objects, pleasant and unpleasant, uh, as real. So therefore, the instruction here is not to strongly identify with our projections such as, this person is my enemy but to recognize that concept, that projection, as a delusion. And this is the instruction on how to relinquish fixation on the reality of unpleasant objects. In sum, in both of these cases, whether it is abandoning fixation on the reality of objects of attachment or on objects of aversion, in either case, what is important is to let go of fixation on the uh, perceived attributes of the object. Can you use that? 
ちょっと待ってはないしんぎ、なおは知心と、自分に水で背中だと、自分に水で背中だと、自分に水で背中だと、自分に水で背中だと、自分に水で背中だと、自分に水で背中だと、自分に水で背中だと、自分に水で背中
ตานันชิงยังกาเชจิสุสุโจวเซนันนาอังกาเชจิจิสุสุมิซินานอเลจิกังเยเตเยเตเยอาดินเดมิกาเชเบจิติเปเซมเนเวคาดิวินเนอุ
of the cultivation of bodhicitta, both relative and absolute. There are five sections to this, um, the, first of, the first of which is the practice of the six perfections. Chorani Sudden the Practices of the six perfections are briefly described in the following six stanzas, starting with the uh, stanza 25 on uh, the bottom of page 28, which describes the practice of generosity, saying, If it is necessary for those who seek awakening to give away even their own bodies, then what need is there to say that external uh, possessions must be given away also? It is therefore the practice of a bodhisattva to give generously without any hope for either payback or um, a karmic, a pleasant karmic maturation. Stanza 26 describes the practice of moral discipline, the second paramita, by saying, If one cannot accomplish one's own good without moral discipline, then to seek to accomplish the good of others without it should be cause for laughter. It is therefore the practice of a bodhisattva to, co to guard moral discipline without any hope for the benefit of it as a higher rebirth. Stanza 27 describes the cultivation of patience, the third perfection, by saying, For a bodhisattva who seeks to accumulate the splendor of, or the wealth of virtue, a, uh, an aggressor or all aggressors are like a discovering a precious treasure. It is therefore the practice of a bodhisattva to cultivate patience that is completely uh, devoid of holding any grudges. And then stanza 28 concerns the practice of diligence. It says, if shravakas and prachyaka buddhas who seek only their own good or practice with, with a diligence that is like that of someone whose, hair, whose head has caught fire, then seeing that, a bodhisattva who seeks to become the source of, who seeks those qualities that are the source of uh, good for everyone, uh, will be all the more uh, diligent. Stanza 29 describes the practice of meditative stability. Knowing that the kleshas are totally conquered by a, by a meditation of insight that is endowed with perfect tranquility. It is the practice of bodhisattvas to cultivate a meditative stability that utterly transcends the four formless states. And then finally, stanza 30 on page 30 describes the practice of a, the perfection of wisdom, saying, as the, the five other perfections 
without wisdom cannot bring the achievement of perfect awakening. It is the practice of a bodhisattva to cultivate that wisdom that endowed with means it is free from reification of the three aspects. That is good. There's not much in any of those six stanzas that is hard to understand in terms of the words. What's hard about this is actually putting it into practice. For example, if we consider the first perfection, generosity, what is the perfection of generosity? Is it simply a giving something to another person, like giving food to someone who is hungry, or clothes to someone who is naked, or a house to someone who has no home? It's more than that. It's more than simply the external act or, or a manner of giving. <laughs> Really, generosity is the attitude of giving, being giving, and motivated by that attitude, actions of giving of body and or speech. But the real force, the real power behind generosity is the motivation, the mental attitude of giving. Therefore, it was taught by the uh, great Kadamba Geshe's that what the root of generosity comes down to is a freedom from fixation and attachment, a freedom uh, from attachment. So therefore, it, it was said by Geshe Sharawa. 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 By Geshe Sharawa, I, I am not going to speak to you of the benefits of giving, but of the uh, the flaws or the problems uh, of fixation or attachment. 
because it comes down to the same thing. Jimbe Jimbe A lot of people um, are motivated in acts of apparent generosity, acts of giving, by uh, their belief in the results or benefit of a generosity. They believe that if I give a one thing, I will get a one thing. If I give two things, I'll get two things, and so on. So basically, many of, many of us, when we practice um, giving, it's because we're hoping for um, a greater benefit in the future, which means that we don't really understand the true nature of a bodhisattva's generosity which is the absence of attachment, absence of, of fixation. It is true that uh, acts of giving will cause affluence in future lives and so on. But if that is the reason why we give, then uh, not only are we ignorant of the, the true nature of the perfection of generosity, the absence of attachment, but we're actually using acts of generosity to increase, further excite uh, our attachment to, to acquisition. And this is why Geshe Sharava said to his disciples, I shall not tell you about the benefits of generosity, but only about the problem caused by attachment. Because if we think about the benefits, then we will ignore the nature of generosity, which is the absence uh, of attachment. So, a bodhisattva's generosity is that bodhisattva's ability to give anything away because they are not attached to anything. It is not the practice, it is not simply giving everything away while still being attached to it. <laughs> Ah, 
Shinu Shida Jabalebe, Do Lobachi, Till it's allowed to return some of the till it's Doborchi. The Nizgilia that trims others. And he didn't do the changes, just as someone over there, he didn't do that, same as his head over the school. That the court didn't give Shinu now, just as the essence of generosity is the a mind uh, of giving, in the same way, the essence of the second uh, perfection, a moral discipline, is a turning away from or turning one's back on renouncing all that is harmful uh, to others together with the potential basis of such harm. That is the basic form of moral discipline. In addition to that, on top of that, a bodhisattva's moral discipline must also include actively helping others, actively benefiting others. Tadam Missy Nindu Tras When we say that the, um, the essence of moral discipline is the mind which abandons or turns away from a wrongdoing, defined as all that is harmful to others together with the potential basis of such harm, principally this refers to the first of the three types of moral discipline of a bodhisattva, which is called the moral discipline of governance or vows or abstention from wrongdoing. When we think of this, um, however, it's important to understand that even this first moral discipline is not simply a matter of outward appearance. It is not enough to adopt the uh, appearance or wear the uniform of a monastic. It is necessary that within one's mind one has the um, stable intention to avoid all that is harmful to others and the basis of such. Especially if one is practicing the moral discipline of a bodhisattva, which is the perfection of moral discipline, then this, this one's motivation for moral discipline is of paramount importance. One might say that in the moral discipline of a shravaka, it is primarily governance uh, of one's physical and verbal behavior that is of importance. But in the case of the moral discipline of a bodhisattva, 
as always with the Bodhisattva path, it is one's mind, one's motivation that is of primary importance. So in addition to a flawless moral conduct, it is necessary that the Bodhisattva's motivation for their flawless moral conduct be a love and affection for other beings. A simple uh, a freedom from flaws of conduct is not enough. Jezabela Migi Jushe and Jusana Luyi Sumarshi Ta Tigilia Migi Le Kashore Migi Oju Le Dalam Shay and Jusana Jilunagi Lugusum the Marshi Vitalia Migi was any ye somebody Migi Le Lam Zat she ordered. ता Mama Dumbele, Chimadi, because emphasize change. Nursing, to share with him, Tati, Nursing, Kashoji, you know, Lamsanji, Simsia, and never somewhere when they are the children of Minyam Neda, Kashobe, Kadu, Gacha, and the other. They mean you start digging and then Tigi Chana. Ta, Nursing, you may say. Hajang Gita, Andraji, Kugurgi, Nizu, those court Cuban Nizu Chari. Dream being that is all the Namjinjis war. Sudim number Tabaji, Kadame Givishinisa, Sudim number Tabasati, Soda, Lentele, Samo Madame Ina, Sudim number Sad, number Tabasaj, Humaris. The name is the Lente, Samo Tonade, Sudim number Tabe. だ、みんなのこと言いそう。when we consider the uh, the principal actions that are governed by a moral discipline, they are such as the ten unvirtuous actions or ten forms of wrongdoing, of which there are three of body, four of speech, and three of mind. Generally speaking, we distinguish between the first seven and the, the latter three by saying that the three actions, unvirtuous actions of body and four of speech are actions and the uh, three of mind are paths of action. Now, this is a way to understand one of the differences between the moral discipline of the pratimoksha per se and that of a bodhisattva. According to the Pratimoksha per se, then if one engages in any of the seven actions of body or speech, this is a contravention. However, the entertainment of a state of mind that constitutes one of the uh, three unvirtuous uh, paths of action of mind, such as malevolence or malice, does not, con does not constitute a contravention of the uh, moral discipline of the Pratimoksha. In contrast to that, the moral discipline of a bodhisattva places a greater emphasis on abstinence from the uh, three unvirtuous actions or paths of action of mind. For example, if a bodhisattva entertains a mental state of malice or malevolence, then this is a direct contravention of their moral discipline of a bodhisattva. Now, if you think about it, someone's mental state, whether or not they are um, entertaining malice or malevolence, 
is a hidden or private matter. It's, it's not observable uh, to an external observer. So therefore, it was taught by the great Kadampa masters that the principal way to maintain pure moral discipline, and especially the moral discipline of a 